Hi, this is Sake Brahman from the OrthoClips podcast series, and today I'm with Dr. Teresa Pazionis, who's an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Temple University School of Medicine and is a spine and musculoskeletal oncology surgeon. Thank you for being with me on the show again. Thanks so much for the interview, Sake. So uh, today we're going to talk about bone cancer of unknown primary, what to do. So basically, if you have a hole in the bone or a lesion, uh, or we can even maybe talk about um, a fracture through that lesion, but what do you do? And I guess the first question I would ask was, would be like, what is exactly, what does this mean? Like maybe can you just define what is a uh, cancer of unknown primary? Well, what are people talking about when they say that? Sure. So as an orthopedic oncologist, I would say the majority of the inpatient consults that we get are for there's a lesion in the bone. It was picked up either incidentally or a patient came into the emergency room with pain uh, in the limb and there is something that looks concerning in their bones, whether that be a litter for a blastic lesion, a pathologic fracture or a fracture that's uh, considered low energy or inconsistent with the energy mechanism that's described uh, by the patient. So all cancers, in a way, start out as unknown primary. And this is a field of study that in orthopedic oncology has been very extensively researched. Uh, initially, Rudgraf et al. in 1993 published a very good paper that's very highly quoted in the orthopedic oncology community that by doing a thorough history and physical examination of the patients, indicated laboratory work, and a CT of chest, abdomen, and pelvis, 86% of cancers can be identified and see where the primary came from. Um, of course, it's important as well to obtain tissue diagnosis, and that'll either be at the time of surgery or if there's a more easy um, lesion to biopsy, certainly a soft tissue lesion or a lymph node in widely metastatic disease, that's possible as well. But truly, cancer of unknown primary is both, I don't know where it came from, and then, all right, once you take the biopsy, if you have no idea where it came from because it's so de differentiated that the pathologic features are blurred by that point. So it can be mean one of those two things. All right, great. Thanks for defining that. Mm -hmm. So that being said, why are we having this discussion? Like, why does this continue to be a problem for clinicians? Because I know the question comes up all the time. What do we do with this? People then ask you know, they get you involved, like, hey, what do we do with this? They'll turn to you. So, um, so why is this important? Why does it continue to be a problem uh, worthy of discussion? So I think it's, it's a problem worthy of discussion for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because once you see a lot of fractures, you know, and when you have a fracture and you have a nail, everything looks like something that can just be easily treated. And we really do need to look further into these because, sure, if it's a metastatic deposit or something like this, at that point, the horse is out of the barn. And treatment of metastatic disease is going to be very different than a primary bone tumor. And misdiagnosing a primary bone tumor as something that's either benign or a metastatic lesion is actually fairly catastrophic. The other thing is that surgical treatment of metastatic tumors has really changed throughout the years. Previously, before we had good biologics and good targeted therapy, a metastatic cancer diagnosis wasn't very good. Um, it's still not great, but it's something that now people are living years as opposed to a mean survival of months uh, prior to the advent of effective chemotherapy. So you really want to give somebody a construct that's going to be durable for them and that it's, they're going to be able to walk on it. Practically, if you have um, tumors like lung cancer um, or renal cancer, or, um, which are, are more aggressive, there's, uh, there's evidence for perhaps taking out the entire lesion as opposed to just nailing it. So it's really, lesions need to be um, identified, both from a pathologic standpoint as well as a morph morphologic standpoint, and treated appropriately, understanding what that patient's survival will be. Um, this is a whole discussion that can be had about the specific treatment per different pathology, but uh, in short, there's also things that you have to prepare for uh, in the preoperative setting. So for example, renal cell carcinoma, melanoma, and myeloma oftentimes can be very bloody, and sometimes uh, we'll consider embolization 100% of the time for renal cell and for thyroid, um, and oftentimes for melanoma as well. 
All right. Um, so what do we do when we see these? Um, like what is the workup? How do we go uh, head out on the right path? Maybe you can give a couple of uh, scenarios or clinical sure. uh, cases to sort of describe um, what we do with these. Okay. So essentially, uh, I'll, I'll give an example of a couple of cases I saw last month. So you have someone who comes in with a lesion in their femur, and oftentimes you won't know where it came from. This patient may have not had a cancer history, but it's something that you take a full history for the patient, talk about past medical history, family history, and see if they're having appropriate cancer screenings. That's something that's oftentimes passed up. The other thing is important uh, is looking at their social history. So if they're a 30-pack uh, year smoker, they're going to be having a higher incidence of lung cancer than somebody who's never smoked in their life. So thorough social, family, past medical history, things like this. Uh, the other thing is blood work. So we do um, CBC, comprehensive metabolic panel, including calcium. Calcium is important because that's really something that if you miss a high calcium level, that could lead to a cardiac arrhythmia and that could kill your patient uh, in the emergency room even. So it's something that as an orthopedic surgeon, you can really make a difference and actually save somebody's life acutely. So checking calcium is very important. Other blood work that we order, uh, serum protein electrophoresis, prostate specific antigen levels, PSA, alkaline phosphatase, and as appropriate, other tumor markers. So if it's somebody with a large ovarian mass, CA-125, um, and then appropriate imaging as, as appropriate. Generally for imaging, I get a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis for patients and a bone scan. Um, a lot of tumors don't turn up on bone scan if they're more aggressive. So that can be a plus or a minus uh, or a skeletal survey. The key thing is obtaining a tissue diagnosis prior to performing a definitive surgical therapy. So oftentimes, let's just say it is truly a solitary lesion and you don't know what it is. If that turns out to be a solitary lesion in the femur that is a chondrosarcoma or an osteosarcoma, if you pass a nail through it, you're really causing a lot of trouble for that patient. Firstly, tumor can be embolized and you're committing that patient to a larger surgery than they would have otherwise needed because of tumor seeding. So all of my consents for a tumor of uh, unknown primary are open biopsy of lesion, possible open reduction, internal fixation. And at the time of surgery, I will actually go over to the pathology lab, look at the tumor under the microscope, and talk to the pathologist about, look, does this look like a carcinoma, or is there a possibility that this is a sarcoma? If there's a possibility it's a sarcoma or they really can't tell, a lot of times you'll consider just leaving it, placing some cement to obtain hemostasis, following your biopsy principles, and taking out a drain distally and in line with the incision. That's happened once or twice in my career, but practically the majority of time they confirm that it's carcinoma, and then you'll appropriately go in and um, perform definitive surgical therapy. One aspect of surgical therapy that's quite important is ensuring that you're not seeding tumor while performing the, oftentimes it's a nail. Um, previously, there was a literature stating that, okay, you could just nail it and it was fine and you would radiate the entire surgical site. Um, a lot of the more current teaching, especially out of places like Sloan Kettering and Massachusetts General Hospital, are uh, performing intralesional curatage of the tumor first and local therapy with cryotherapy to prevent seeding of the tumor all the way up and down the medullary cavity once you're passing your nail. And that's something that I do in my practice, and I think it does lead to less tumor seeding and less recurrence of tumor. So what are some of the challenges that persist despite what we know and have learned uh, from the literature and clinical experience? Um, like what challenges continue to uh, present problems for clinicians trying to identify and, um, uh, you know, triage these or figure out what's going on and what maybe what research is being done to help meet these challenges mm -hmm. and difficulties that we still have? Sure. So I think uh, the biggest challenge is something that really is, is resource driven. 
So an orthopedic oncologist isn't necessarily present at every center, but people do get cancer everywhere. So if you're at a small community hospital where you don't have access to an orthopedic oncologist and someone comes in with a fracture that looks concerning and you don't have a pathologist available, okay, you're going to do the best that you can for that patient, but it's just sort of recognizing, well, I don't really know what to do, so perhaps either I should send this fracture if the patient's stable to a center where there is an orthopedic oncologist or a pathologist. Um, or if you have to stabilize the fracture, um, understanding that you have that conversation with the patient and perhaps plan for something like an external fixator if you're very concerned that it could be something primary or um, perhaps nailing it, but also having the conversation with the patient that there may be more therapy required afterwards. Um, the orthopedic oncology community, this is something that we talk about every single meeting, um, the OOPS surgery where someone does a very well-meaning surgery to be of benefit to a patient. Um, they look at something, it looks like metastatic disease, it's read pathologically to show perhaps carcinoma, but dedifferentiated carcinoma, and it comes back as a dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma. And then you're really buggered. Um, and it's something that there is really no great answer for, but the key thing is a good, thoughtful process where you're treating that patient meaningfully and understanding that, yes, it is possible that this is a primary bone tumor, and you have to plan accordingly for that. So the more uh, education we can give to the orthopedic community um, and the more understanding people have and the more uh, people actually pay attention on their orthopedic oncology rotation, I think the better we're going to do for our patients. The other thing that really is uh, something that's uh, of current thought is given patients are surviving longer, should we be doing more durable constructs? So let's just say 20 years ago, widely metastatic lung cancer, okay? Um, that would be a few months survival. So it may be totally fine to just pass a nail down and say, all right, your leg's stabilized, that's fine. On you go. Currently, if patients um, have an ALK or an EFGR mutation, uh, they may have very good targeted therapy where they're living significantly longer, we're talking years, and they're going to be at a higher risk just temporarily of skeletal related events um, or recurrence in that area if the tumor seeds. So we really do need to be perhaps changing our algorithm of thinking about the surgical management and should we be doing more actual resections of these tumors depending on a patient's longevity. Uh, something that's actually very important for both clinicians and residents to note is Jonathan Forsberg uh, has created a pathologic tool called PathFX. Um, and objective survival estimates are very important when treating or studying outcomes in patients with skeletal metastasis. And this tool, you enter a number of values into the system and it will project each patient's post-surgical survival trajectory at one, three, six, and 12 months for these patients that are undergoing stabilization. And it's been validated within the United States, within Japan, in a number of places, and it will actually help provide some guidance um, in terms of how long your patient's going to live and what the optimal surgical therapy for that patient is. Great. Sounds like something anybody can get a hold of this tool? Absolutely. Yeah, anyone can sign up. Uh, if you're a medical student, you can sign up. If you're a researcher, um, all the way up to uh, anyone who's a uh, surgeon, orthopedic, or otherwise. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think we're pretty much out of time. Uh, and I think, uh, that was a great podcast. Uh, great. Thanks. Doctor. Um, yeah. So I've been speaking with, uh, Teresa Pazionis, um, from Temple about bone cancer of unknown primary, what to do. Um, thank you very much. I think that was very informative for our listeners. Thank you. Great. Thanks.